ASP.NET Core provides a built-in dependency injection container. The framework takes the responsibility of creating and managing the lifetime of the dependency objects. In this video, let's understand the default container that ships with ASP.NET Core and the various features that it provides to make dependency injection easier. So let's get started by creating a web application and see how dependency injection works in ASP.NET Core. Heading off to my console using the .NET CLI, let's create a new web API using the .NET new command and specifying web API as the template. This is going to create a web API application into the current folder. To open this up in Visual Studio Code, let's use code and give dot to open the current folder. This opens up Visual Studio Code with the current folder loaded. We see we have the program.cs and the startup.cs class. In a previous video, we learned how the configure method is used to configure middlewares in ASP.NET Core. If you want to know more about middlewares and how that works in ASP.NET Core, check out the video linked here or in the description below. Dependency injection is configured using the configure services method. In here, you add all the services that your application requires. Let's look how this works. Before going into details of configure services, Let's scroll a bit up and see the startup class. You can see that the startup class already takes in a dependency. In this case, it's an iConfiguration. So that's a configuration object which represents a key value pair. Now this configuration could be loaded from anywhere, including your JSON files, environment variables, or Azure Key Vault, for example. This dependency is injected in by the ASP.NET Core runtime. And there are a few limitations on the types that can be injected in here. We can inject in a iWeb host environment and also we can inject in a iHost environment which is basically the same as in the web host environment. So if you're using a web host, you would be injecting the web host environment. You cannot inject in any other services through this startup class constructor. If I was to ask for iLogger, this is going to throw an exception at runtime. To run this application in Visual Studio Code, I'm pressing F5 which will prompt me to select the environment. Let's select .NET Core, which creates a launch.json file. So let's close that and press F5 again. This is going to run the application. We get an exception as expected. It says unable to resolve a service for type iLogger. So we cannot specify any other interfaces other than the three that I mentioned. That's iConfiguration, iWebHost, and the iHost environment. So let's remove the iLogger to get this to work. Pressing F5 again should run the application as expected. The application is up and running fine. If we go to the slash weather forecast endpoint, we get the API values back. This is the default behavior of the template. In the configure services method, we already have one line of code which says services.addController. If you go into the definition of that, you can see this by default registers all the dependencies that's required for the web API to work. So this is adding in the MVC services that's commonly used for features with the controllers. So features like API Explorer, authorization, cores, data annotations, formatter mappings, etc. The ASP.NET runtime also injects in a lot of framework provided services. You can see a list of them in the link here, which will be in the description below. So we can see the web host environment in here, which we saw a while back. We can also see there is an iLogger factory, an iLogger, and also an I options and similar classes. Let's go back to the source code. If we take a look at the weather forecast controller, so I'm using control P in Visual Studio Code to navigate to files, so I can type in weather forecast controller. You can also use a short form and specify WFC to select weather forecast controller. So let's select that. The weather forecast controller constructor expects in an I logger dependency. This is exactly how dependency injection works. You state the need that you need a logger and you're not worried whether it logs to a file, a console, or to an external logging service. All you need is a logger to which you can log to. By default, the ASP.NET Core logger is configured to log to the console and a few other providers. So if I was to write a log statement here, let's say underscore logger dot log information and say hello from help weather forecast. Let's run this application and we can see this logged in the console. Let's navigate to the weather forecast endpoint and you can see there is a hello from weather forecast in the console. So if this logger was reconfigured to use an external logger, let's say like a SQL database or a file system, these log statements would then appear 
in there. With dependency injection, we have inverted the dependencies. The weather forecast controller no longer needs to know how the logger is implemented. All it cares about is that it needs a functionality to log, which it gets in through the iLogger interface. Let's go back to the startup.cs class. The configure services takes in an iService collection. If you go into the definition of that, it is just a collection of service descriptor. So now what is a service descriptor? A service descriptor describes a service with its service type, implementation, and lifetime. The service type is usually the interface or an abstract base class. It could also be a class in itself. The implementation is the class that implements the abstract class or the interface. Or when it is a class, it's just the class itself again. And also there is a lifetime. At a high level, there are three lifetimes in ASP.NET Core. Transient, Scoped, and Singleton. Transient is just like if you had written a new and called in the constructor explicitly anywhere you needed an external dependency. So with Transient, the services are created each time they are requested for from the service container. Scoped lifetime services are created once in the entire request scope. So within the context of a request, if you ask for the same type twice, you will get the same instance. Singleton services are created once when they are requested and then the same instance is used throughout the application lifetime. So until the app shuts down, you're going to get the same instance whenever you ask for a singleton service. Let's understand this a bit more better. Here, I have a dependency injection container. Let's assume it is the ASP.NET Core container. And we have three kinds of services registered. The T with the green marks a transient service. SC in the orange marks the scoped service and SI in the yellow marks singleton service. Let's say we have a request coming in and to a controller endpoint, which has two dependencies as shown in this image. The controller has a dependency on a transient service. Imagine this would be defined like the iLogger in our example in weather forecast. So it gets injected a T1, which is an instance of type T. If the dependency that the controller has also has a dependency with T1, that gets injected a new instance, which is represented here as T2. Similarly, if the controller needs an SC1, which is a scoped service, it gets injected a scoped service 1, which is a new instance. Now, if any other dependency within the controller needs the same dependency, it's going to get the same instance. So in here, it will also be scoped 1. With singleton, it's getting created the same instance. So that's marked with SI without any numbering because that's only one instance. Now, if anybody else needs the same instance, it's going to get exactly the same instance. Let's say a new request comes in. In that case, with the transient, it's going to get new instances represented here with T3 and T4. With scoped, it's going to get a new instance as well for that particular request, which is represented here with SC2. But note, the other dependency also gets SC2, which is the same in this request lifecycle. With singleton, it's getting the same instance as the previous request. This is what the pattern would be for these lifetimes. Let's see an example. Let's head back to Visual Studio Code and open up the folder explorer. Let's create a new file. You can either use Control alt n which is a shortcut for me, or you could also use the button in here, which should show you what the shortcut is for you. So it says Control alt n So using Control alt n it's going to create a new file. Let's create a new class called dependency.cs. I have some code written before, so let me copy paste that. We have an interface defined with i operation which has a GUID operation ID. Now I have different interfaces defined with I operation transient, I operation scoped, I operation singleton, and also I operation singleton instance. All of these implements the same interface I operation. All of them gets to expose the same property GUID operation ID. You would have noticed by now, all of them uses the lifetime scope names that we just saw, transient, scoped, and singleton. So we will use these to register it into the container. Now the implementation is an operation class which implements all the interface and exposes a GUID property operation ID. You can explicitly set this, the GUID, by using the operation constructor or you can use the public constructor which by default uses a GUID.new GUID. So let's see how we can register this into the application. So going back to startup.cs, 
Let's start registering them in the services class. Earlier we saw that the iService collection is nothing but a collection of service descriptor. So this list of services would ideally be taking in a service descriptor. So let's start by creating one. So let's say where item is equal to new service descriptor and pass in the values that it requires. This requires a service type. So let's first register the I operation transient interface. So we specify the type of I operation transient. The next it needs a function which takes in a service provider and gives back the object. So that's basically a factory to create this object when it is requested for. So let's define the factory by giving in a function and we just need to create a new operation class because that's all that's required for that particular type. Now it needs to specify a lifetime. In this case, we know we need a transient lifetime. So let's specify transient. To add this into the services collection, we can use the services.add method and pass in the item that we just created. Now this is a lot of code to write every time you want to register a dependency. So the services collection has extension methods that helps you to do this very easily. To do the exact same above, we can use the services and specify the add transient method. So this has various overloads. We can use the generic overload in here. So let's specify the angle bracket and specify the I operation transient and also specify the class that implements it. In this case, the operation. And then let's close the angle bracket and the function. So this is doing exactly the same as what we have done in here. So we can now safely remove that. And that's just one line of code to register this interface. So to register the I operation scoped, we can use the services dot add scoped extension method, specify the I operation scoped and specify the same class operation in this case. Now you know what the next one would be. So add singleton to register the I operation singleton and then specify the operation class again. For the I operation singleton instance, we'll still use the add singleton, but specify the I operation singleton instance, in which case we can specify the object that's required to be created. So this has an overload, which takes in a function. So let's specify that and give a new operation. So if we want, we can specify a specific GUID. In this case, let's use GUID.empty. So anytime this instance is going to be required, it's going to return a GUID.empty. Let's go to the folder explorer and create a new file to create a dependency. So let's again use control alt n. Let's create dependency service one dot cs class. I have the code written before. Let's copy paste that. So this is basically defining a dependency service one. It takes in all the types that we just defined. I operation transient, scoped, singleton, and singleton instances. It saves to this class instance and then writes it into the console when called the write method. Let's add the appropriate usings. Let's modify this from service to say from dependency service one. So we know this is written from the dependency service one. Let's also add a console write line, a blank line, so that it's neatly separated. So this is going to write to the console anytime the write method is called when we can see all the values of the GUID that's getting used. This will help us to understand the scopes and how they work. So let's make sure to format this and create one more class very similar to this, which will be dependency service two. So let's copy this class and create a new class dependency service two. So let's say dependency service two dot CS and paste the full contents there. Let's rename this to match two and also the constructor. So we have two dependencies that takes in the exact same dependencies to that. This is just for representation uses. In your real application, it might be different. You might have different dependencies that depend on various other things. And some of them might have common. Let's go back to the weather forecast controller and start using these dependencies. So after the logger, we can specify the dependency service one that we require and specify a name for that. And also let's take in a I dependency service two and specify dependency service two. In this case, I'm injecting the class directly. You could also abstract this as an abstract class or an interface and inject that in. This is just to show you that you can also inject a class.
So let's add the two properties for them. So we have the dependency service 1 and dependency service 2 and these dependencies are getting saved to that. Let's come to the get method and start writing to the console. So in this case, we are not cared about this return. So let's remove that and return the enumerable.empty to make the compiler happy. So let's call in the dependency service 1.write and also the dependency service 2.write. So this is going to write out all the values of those GUIDs that it has. Let's make sure to specify a weather forecast so that it knows what type of enumerable to return. Let's put a breakpoint here so that we can debug this whenever it is running. Let's also go back to the startup class and add a breakpoint here. Now one thing that we are missing here is that we have not added the dependency service references into this services class. So this cannot inject without that. Let's see what will happen if you run the application without specifying those dependencies. It's going to show an exception that unable to resolve dependency service 1. So anytime the container is asked for a weather forecast controller, it looks for the dependency service 1 and sees it's not registered because of which it's throwing the exception now. So let's go back to the application and register that in. To register the dependency service classes, we can use services. Let's specify add transient because that is just like a new instance every time. So let's specify dependency service 2 and specify the same class as its implementation. So this is how you would register a class. Now to also register the dependency service 1, we can specify the dependency service 1 and dependency service 1. So this is going to register those two classes into the services container. Let's put a breakpoint here also to see what is happening. So let's run this application. So it hits the services.add controllers. If you were to look at the services, you can see there's already 69 count, which means there's 69 items added to this particular collection. And you can see all the service descriptors that's added along with their lifetime. You can see singletons, transient, and all other lifetimes that's getting added. Also, what kind of dependencies there are, like host builder context, I host environment, I logger. So all these are the framework injected dependencies. When you call the services.addController's method, it's going to call these kind of methods to add in the dependencies required for the web API controller infrastructure to work. So let's step over and run this. So once this method is going to get completed, it's going to add all these services into this collection. And you can see the count has now increased to 163. So let's run this and go to the weather forecast endpoint. So this is hitting the get endpoint and calling on to the right. So let's clear this console to understand what's happening a bit better. Let's step through the console. So it says dependency service one dot right and then the two dot right. So you can see this says from dependency service one and from dependency services two. Let's look at the values for the GUIDs that's coming here. So we can see that the transient value is different in each case. So this transient starts with 345 and this one starts with 500 from the two dependencies. For the scoped, you can see it starts with 6E3 and it's exactly same as the scoped in dependency service 2. Like we saw earlier, with a transient lifetime, a new dependency is created every time it's requested from the container. So when the dependency 1 asks for an instance of I scoped transient, it gets a new instance and the dependency 2 asks, it gets another instance. Whereas with scoped, it's tied to the request. Since all these is happening in the same request pipeline, it gets an instance that's specific for that particular request pipeline. So within the same request, since both of them require, it's getting exactly the same instance. Now with singleton, it's the same in this case. It has the same value in here. Note that in singleton instance, since we overread it to use the guid.empty, it's showing a guid.empty. So let's continue the execution and make a request once more to see the second request cycle. I still have the console from the previous request. So let's step through this and see how this compares to both the request. Let me expand this a bit more so that we can see all the values that's written out. So for the next request, which starts from here, we have the transient values again different as expected because anytime it's requested, it's going to create a new instance. Whereas with scoped, it's the same within this request cycle, but this is different from the request cycle of the previous one. So this one starts with 6E3, however this starts with an FFC. With the singleton, we get the same value 
as we got in the previous request. So that is because the singleton is just created once for the entire app's lifetime. With singleton instance, we are still getting the GUID.MT. So that is working as expected. So let's stop this and go back to the startup.cs. If I was to add another instance of the same add singleton and specify the iOperation singleton instance, but this time not specify the GUID.MT. So we are basically adding two registrations of, for the same type, the iOperation singleton instance. Now in this case, the last one always wins. So whichever is registered the last takes the precedence and that gets injected in. To see that, let's run this application. You can see now the singleton instance has a value non-empty GUID. This is because we added the registration twice and the last one always wins. Now let's say in this case, you are actually adding multiple instances for the same interface. We want an I enumerable of those classes. So let's come back to our controller class and ask in for an I enumerable of this class and see what happens. Let's add the all singleton instances in here which takes an i enumerable of i operation singleton instance and loop through each of them and write to the console. Let's run and see what happens. So if I was to look at the all singleton references, we can see two classes getting injected. So this has two different types being injected into this particular variable. Since we asked for an i enumerable, clear the console and loop through this. So we see one of the values is the guid.mt and the other one is the next value that we overrode that with. So in this case, when we add it, the service collection is still having all these types referenced there. However, the last one is getting served whenever you simply ask for an instance of I operation singleton instance, which was what was happening in dependency service. But when you ask an enumerable of that type, you're going to get an enumerable of the instances for that particular type. So if there was only one, you would just get one item. Since in this case we added two, we are getting two. So let's go back to the startup class. So let's say we want to try and add something. So we'll want to check whether a type is first registered or not, and then add that. For those cases, you can use the try add method. So if I was to use the try, it's coming up from a different namespace. So we'll need to use that particular namespace. Adding that in should get this to work. So using the try add singleton, this is going to add only if a previous instance was not registered. So now if we run this application, we are going to get only one value into the enumerable because this one is not going to get added. Now we can see in the all singleton instances, we just have one value. This is because we used the try add extension method. Similar to try add singleton, we also have the try add scoped, try add transient. There is also a try add enumerable, which basically looks at the implementation type and ignores that if it's same for the register type. So if you register the I operation singleton instance with the same new operation, it's going to ignore that. However, if it's a different implementation, let's say operation one and operation two, in that case, it will add that. When you design services or classes, for instance, there are some recommendations from Microsoft to make them compatible with dependency injection. So basically it says design services to use the dependency injection to obtain their dependencies. In this examples, we used constructor injection, which is the most popular used injection. You could also define it using properties and also through functions. But I always prefer to use the constructor based injection where possible. It also gives in a lot more practices to follow through. So you can go through that and see for yourself. I'll put a link in the description below. The default container that ships with ASP.NET Core is for basic purposes. If you have been used to other dependency injection containers, like Autofac, for example, you might have seen it provides a lot more capabilities, like using registrations by conventions. Now there's nothing stopping you from writing some custom code using reflection to add these dependencies into the default container that ships with ASP.NET Core. However, if you want to get those out of the box, you can also replace the dependency injection container that ships by default with one of these that's there in this list. So you can go through this to understand how they work and use this to swap for a different container implementation. But overall, the concepts of the lifetime and how they work are mostly similar across all these different implementations. I hope this helps you to understand more about dependency injection in ASP.NET Core and how the default container works and also understand about the lifetimes 
and how they affect the objects and instances that you use in your application. We have looked at dependency injection just from a container perspective, but dependency injection is a much larger concept, not limited to just using containers. You could also use dependency injection without using containers. If you want to learn more about dependency injection, make sure to check out the book Dependency Injection Principles, Practices and Patterns, which also uses .NET Core code samples. This is an excellent book for understanding more about dependency injection and how to use it effectively to write loosely coupled code. If you like this video, please hit the like button. I am adding in more videos on the ASP.NET Core series where we will see different aspects of ASP.NET Core and also good patterns that I have found useful when writing applications. If you want to be notified when they come out, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Thank you and see you soon.